Good morning. It is so good to see you this morning that we get to gather together and worship together. We are glad that you are here, whether you're in person or whether you're watching online. We are happy to be able to worship with you. Uh, if you are a first-time guest or first-time visitor, uh, please go online and fill out the contact card on there so we know how to, to get in touch with you and we can call you and pray with you and those type things. Just a couple of announcements this morning. Rise Against Hunger campaign is still actively going. Uh, we're looking to pack 20,000 meals, and in that process, of course, we're raising about 8,000 funds. We will be packing on Palm Sunday, the 28th, and I've got two shifts. I've got a 2 o'clock shift, and I've got a 4 o'clock shift, and I can have about 40 at each one, the way we've got them all spread out. So be sure to go online on the main page and find the Rise Against Hunger link. Click there and sign up so we know exactly who all we have coming. Uh, other than the elevator is still in progress, don't, that whole stairwell down there is blocked off. Don't try to use it. I did this morning. Luckily, it was padlocked and I couldn't fall, but don't try to use it because um, there is no stairwell there anymore, but we're excited where we are with the elevator getting started. And then one last announcement, Hugh Hargett uh, joined the church this morning at the first service, so if you see Hugh or contact him, just tell him hi and about time or whatever else you want to say to him in that process, but we are glad that he is here. Let's stop and, and ask God to be a part of our service this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all that you have given us for this glorious day that we have outside, for this glorious week that we have had. We are reminded of spring and hope and renewal. We ask this morning that you would come and fill our time together, that everything we do this morning would be pleasing to you, and that you would fill our adoration and worship. In your precious name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing and worship God together this morning. Oh 
You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Precious Father, Holy Spirit, Jesus, the one true God, we come to you this morning. We come in humility. We come awestruck by your great power. Lord, we know that you are the creator of all things that you created the world that we live in, but you also created us individually, and that you love each of us and desire that relationship with us. We give you thanks for that mighty, mighty act and the powerful work that Jesus did on the cross. Lord, this morning we give you thanks for new hope as springtime arrives and emotions change and people begin to pick up and smile. We give you thanks for those seasons of our lives that you give us. We pray for a new sense of hope in our community and in our nation and in our church. We would focus again on you and you alone. Lord, this morning there's so many around us that are hurting for so many different reasons, some still fighting the virus, but many other illnesses emotional problems, financial problems, whatever it may be. We ask that you would surround them with your presence. That you would reach down and touch them, that they would feel you near them, and they would feel a sense of peace. We pray that you would make them whole again. That you would renew them and heal them that they might be testimonies of your great works for all others to see. Lord, I give you thanks for this church, for their eagerness to serve, their eagerness to worship, to learn, to grow. We ask that we, you would help us rem remember that you are the main focus of all that we do. For that, Lord, we want a new sense of purpose to reach a community around us that is so desperately in need of seeing you this morning. Help us be that light to them that they need. That they might look at us and see you and not us. That they might see Jesus. Lord, we ask for all of this this morning by praying the prayer that you first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship God this morning in song. Lord. 
can be seated. And we want to invite our children now um, to head out to Children's Church. They can go with Miss Kim and Miss Mary Bell. And I'm sorry, I was not quick enough. I want to ask everybody to please stand again in, reading, in honor of reading God's holy word. This morning's passage of scripture is John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread, so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of God for the gathered people of God. Please be seated. All right, I, I want to share with you something uh, this morning, um, and it, it's some lies that... Uh, Parents have told their children in order to get them to mind them or to do certain things. Now, I am in no way affirming any of these. As a matter of fact, I would say it would be a terrible idea for you to follow their example, but they are rather humorous. The first one um, is this. When she was small, I told my daughter that when she lied, a red spot would appear on the middle of her forehead. I knew for sure it worked when she did indeed lie, and then her hand went up to cover her forehead. My father always said the animals on the side of the road were just taking a nap since the road was warm. If you eat enough vegetables, your body makes them taste like candy. The rumble strips on the highway are for the blind drivers. It took this young lady seven years to figure that one out. When she went to the store, okay, now this, these next two are kind of mean, all right? When we went to the store, my mom used to say, every time you touch something, a kitten dies. <laughs> now, that's a mom, okay? That's a woman. It's, it's not a man. But this next one is a dad, all right? My dad told me oil stains on the street were little kids that got run over because they didn't hold anyone's hand while crossing the street. <laughs> and the last one... Uh, it's one of my favorites. My mom always asked my brother's kindergarten teacher what he had done during the day. Then back at home, she would speak with him about these things, telling him that she had a special channel on her TV where she can watch him all day long. <laughs> Why do we do the things that we do? What is it that motivates us? Why do we do the things that we do in our spiritual lives, in our lives of faith? 
People take part in religious things for a wide variety of reasons, and and it's okay to be a part of religious things. Um, That word, there's nothing wrong with that. We're all religious. We all worship something or somebody in some manner. It's just that we want our religion to go beyond rituals and into a relationship with the Lord. We want it to be an intimate thing. We want our religion to be a good and righteous religion, but why do we do what we do? We need to think about those um, questions and really wonder. There are good reasons for us to love Jesus, and then there are reasons that are not so good. Why do we love Jesus? All right, the first four verses here. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain. And there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. All right, it says that a large crowd was following Jesus. Verse 10 tells us and says that 5,000 men. Now we know that typically the scriptures would refer just to the, the number of men that were present. But we also know that most likely there would be women and children that were there. And a good Jew is always married, so most likely there's a one-to-one ratio of men and women there. And they also believe in procreation very strongly, and so they would have as many children as they could have. So we're going to just say that there's at least um, a child per couple. And so there's a good chance that there is between five and 15,000 people that were a part of this huge crowd that um, is referred to here. You know, I have bought in the past, I've bought pizza for up to 100, maybe 200 teenagers. And that is a lot of food. That's a lot of pizza. But I want you to think about 15,000 hungry people who've been out there all day and, and into, it's becoming evening and, and they are starving and they are hungry. And Jesus is going to feed them and what that would look like. Now, the other thing, it says that the Passover was at hand, and that's something you need to take notice of. That's part of the context. That's part of what John wants you to be thinking about, that the Passover meal is at hand. Of course, what the Passover is the foundations of what we have for communion, where we celebrate the the body and the blood of Jesus, the, the bread and the wine. And so the Passover is at hand. And the, follow, the crowd followed. Why? Because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Um, and so Jesus has been doing... We've got seven sign narratives that we're talking about during this season of Lent. But he's doing, doing all sorts of things. I mean, he's doing all sorts of signs. He is healing people on a regular basis. And they've seen that, and that's why they're there. Why did the crowd love Jesus? And why do we love Jesus? That's an important question for us to think about. And the first reason that I think that we should love Jesus is this. Jesus is the Messiah, our God who creates. He is the Messiah, our God who creates. Let's look at verses 5 through 11. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. So five to 15,000 folks there, and they are starving. It's been a long period of time, and they haven't had anything to eat. They've been on journeys to get to that place. And they're starving, and they get as much fish and bread as they want, and Jesus feeds them. Why do we love Jesus? The first and the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And according to the scriptures, Jesus is the Lord God. He is the Messiah. He is almighty. He is the creator. And so we're uh, compelled to love him. That's the most important thing that we can do is to love Jesus. Verse 6 says that this was a test, a test for Philip. Now, Philip had seen Jesus turn water into wine. He'd seen him heal um, the, the leader's son. He'd seen him heal the paralyzed man. He'd seen him do many, many other signs and healings. And Philip, unfortunately, failed the test that day. He did not pass the test. He was supposed to say something like this. Money? Shopping? You turn water into wine. What do you want me to do, Master? How are you going to do this? I'm in complete dependence upon you. How should we respond here? Um, the scriptures say, be still and know that the Lord is God. When are the most difficult times for me to maintain my faith? When is it most difficult for me to be strong in my faith? For me, um, Unfortunately, it's happened many more times than I would like to admit, but typically it's when I forget that the Lord is God and that Jesus is my Savior, that He is Almighty, that He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, that He's the creator of the beauty that surrounds us, that, that when you drove to church today and it was such a beautiful day, He's the one that's made that sun and the nature and the trees and the beautiful 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 grass. He's the one that's made all that we see and experience. Not only that, he's the one that saw you and us and me in our desperate need and came for us, that rescued us. When I forget that, and, and typically when do we forget it? When things start to go bad, right? When we get discouraged, when we don't feel well, when uh, we're challenged when maybe our perceptions are challenged, when maybe our faith is even challenged. We begin to struggle and we begin to falter because we've forgotten. We have not been still. We've not known that the Lord is God. And not only that, that he's your rescuer, that he's your savior, that he's the one that comes for you. Why do we love Jesus? We love Jesus because he made us, and because he's our savior. Um, look with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. This is a passage from the Old Testament that helps us understand what's going on here in our passage. And this is Moses that's speaking. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him, for this is what you asked for, I mean, you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. Now, remember what this is all about. This is when the people had been set free from slavery in Egypt, and they were out in the desert, they were out in the mountain of God, and God said he was going to reveal himself, and, and he revealed his voice there. And, and with fire, and it freaked them out. They were so scared, and that's a good thing, because the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord, right? And so they said, we can't take this. You're a holy God. We, we know we can't abide your presence that way. And, and so God said, you're right. This is a good thing. As a matter of fact, in the future, I'm going to approach you in a special way. And that's what he's talking about here. This prophet that Moses, the greatest of prophets, says will come a one greater than him. The Lord said to me, what they said is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. This is the prophecy, one of the major prophecies, one of the cornerstone prophecies of the Old Testament for the Messiah. All the Jews knew this passage. And so they all understood um, this prophecy and what was anticipated. And ultimately, they understood what was going on on this day. This miracle, this sign narrative, 
is very, very important. Um, other than Jesus' resurrection, it's the only miracle in all four of the Gospels. There's a reason that the Lord has done it that way. This is something he's repeating, he's focusing on. He says, pay attention here. I'm trying to say something that I want you to see and to catch. In Genesis chapter 2, God takes a rib and creates an entire woman. In Exodus, God created manna and quail. On the shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus turns a little boy's lunch into food for 15,000 people. The Lord wanted to make sure that everyone knew that Jesus was the Messiah, that he had creative power. When Jesus turned water into wine, I talked about, we talked about this a few weeks back, and I, I recall the fact that the, the only real pineapple that I probably ever had was in Hawaii because it tasted so good because it was a special source from that volcanic um, ash. And the best sweet corn that I'd ever had in my life was from the silt from the bottom of Lake Apopka in Florida. And that corn was out of this world. Jesus made the best wine that any wedding has ever had. And he, the best fish that I personally have ever had was off the, it was on the coast of North Carolina. And it was a simple fish. It was just a flounder. But it was flounder that was caught that day. And then fried that evening, and it was delicious. And why? Because it was fresh fish. It had just come out of the ocean that day. Can you imagine what it was like to not get fresh fish, but to get freshly created fish <laughs> that day? And how delicious that fish must have been. And we all have a weakness for bread and for rolls, right? And, and Jesus makes the best bread that you could have ever tasted and put in your mouth. All of that happens on this particular day. Why do we love Jesus? Because he created us and because he saved us. We are in the middle, in the, the fourth of the sign narratives, and this sign narrative is one that God doesn't want any of us to miss and to understand that Jesus is almighty, but he's also our Savior. The second reason that we love Jesus is this. In order to save us, Jesus did things the Father's way. He did things the Father's way. Let's go now to the last two verses of our passage. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said... This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and, make, and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is that prophet that we're talking about. This is the one that, that Moses had prophesied about in Deuteronomy. And they understood it. It didn't miss them. They knew who he was. They saw him create fish and bread out of nothing. And they saw all those people enjoy it. They caught it. They realized that that, that prophet had come. Um, you know what verse 6 tells us? It tells us that this was a test for Philip, right? And we know that Philip failed his test. But this day and, and this experience is also a test for Jesus. And it's a unique test. Because now they're trying, they want to make him king. And I want you to go back and remember uh, before Jesus' ministry began, what happened. He was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And then the Holy Spirit led him out into the desert for 40 days um, to fast and to pray and to be prepared for the ministry. And at the end of those 40 days, um, the scriptures say that Satan came to tempt him. And I want to talk to you about two of those temptations, all right? And the first one was um, a very simple one, and one related to our story here today. And Satan, uh, the Bible says that after 40 days, Jesus got hungry. What does that mean? I mean, surely he was hungry before that, right? But this was a special kind of hunger. All of his fat by 40 days has been eaten up on his body now. And now his body is turning inward on itself. And now he's... He's consuming his muscle and his other tissue. And so he is hungry. He is really hungry. Hungry like most of us have never experienced before. 
And Satan says to him, if you're the son of God, tell this stone uh, to turn into what? A loaf of bread. What he's just created out in the wilderness now for all these people. And what does Jesus say in response? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, he stops him. He says, no, that's not right. I'm not going to fall prey to my flesh, to my own physical wants and desires and passions. And then the other temptation that I want to share with you is the one where he takes him up on a high mountain place and and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And Satan says, "Um, if you'll but bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And Satan really could have done it. Because he's the prince of the air, he's the prince of this world. Because we have fallen to sin, he has control and the power. And Jesus could have done tremendous things. He could have taken, what? A shortcut into God's will. But what does Jesus say instead? He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He quotes scripture again to him. And he says to Satan, "Uh -uh uh-uh-uh-uh. I'm not going to take a shortcut. I'm going to do things God's way. And then in our passage here today, Jesus is tempted again. Remember what it says. It says that Satan left him until an opportune time. And this is one of those other opportune times. At this point, Jesus has all these people. They recognize him with the, the main sign narrative they, they believe it. They know that he's the Messiah, and they're willing to make him king. And he's given the opportunity for another shortcut. He could have done so much good. I mean, Satan, I'm sure, was saying to him, you're the wisest man who's ever lived. You've never sinned. You can be king. You can do such good. You can eventually stop all the wars in the world. You can stop all the suffering and the hunger and everything that's gone wrong in this world. You've got to take it. You've got to do it this way. But Jesus says, "Uh -uh 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 -uh. I won't take a shortcut. I'll do things God the Father's way. Why? Because if he'd become king, if he'd done it the world's way, the political way, the power way, he'd have never died for your sins and my sins. And that was the whole reason for coming. The only reason he came was to rescue us, to save us. And so he was willing to do it the hard way and not take the shortcut and follow and obey the Father. Why do we love Jesus? Because he never takes a shortcut. He does what the Father tells him, and he never allows other people to force him into disobeying the Father. The third reason why we love Jesus is this. Jesus is the bread of life, so he wants to abundantly supply all our needs. He's the bread of life, so he wants to abundantly supply all our needs. It's not that he just says, okay, son or daughter, okay, you got to have food to eat this week. You got to have money for the power bill. Okay, I'll get you some. He wants to supply our needs. He wants to supply it in an abundant, over-generous manner to us. He wants our needs met um, greatly. Look with me now to verses 12 through 13. And When they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. All right, it's interesting, isn't it, that John only mentions the bread here. He doesn't say anything about the fish, does he? Um, Mark does tell us that there were fragments of fish and bread. And, and, you know, we've all cleaned up after meals. There's always fragments of everything, right, typically of of bread and fish. And we know there were because the other Gospels tell us. So why does John focus and only mention the bread? We're about to find that out in just a minute. Twelve baskets, huge traveling baskets are left over. Why is that? 
There are 12 apostles, one basket for each apostle. So each one gets to see with his own hands that that whole basket is full of the fragments that are left over. 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus is letting us know, the Lord is letting us know that God not only can feed everybody represented by Israel, 15,000 people, but he can have enough for everyone in Israel and everyone beyond. That there is an abundance. There is extra. There's the, God's generous, and so he's made his people to be generous. He's going to give you and me an abundance so that we can give and we can be generous in the same way that he's been. Now, the next sign narrative after this one is when Jesus walks on the Sea of Galilee, when his disciples are the next morning or in the middle of the night are going across the Sea of Galilee. In the morning, the people that are left from that evening realize that Jesus is gone. And they take off after him across the lake um, to find him and to talk to him. And this is what they say and interact with, or at least some of what they say and interact with, when they catch him on the other side. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now pay attention here. Not because the signs I performed. You know, John only tells us about essentially the miracle of uh, multiplying the loaves and the fish. But the other gospels let us know that Jesus didn't just give food to them that day. He taught them for hours and hours before he gave them the food. And not only that, he healed people for hours and hours. So there were many times, many signs that they saw that day. Not just the food. Not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. What's a sign? A sign points us to the important thing. The sign isn't the important thing. The sign is the thing that gets us to understand the point, to know what the point is. The person and the point is Jesus. And they're fixated on the pointer. They're fixated on the signs rather than Jesus. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. All right, don't freak out and don't think, okay, well, God, he, he doesn't want us to be concerned about our careers and working. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, don't let these things get to be a distraction to you. Don't pay attention to the signs um, as much as you pay attention to the one that they point to. The biggest point, the point that matters the most, is Jesus, your Savior. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. All right, I skip a a few more passages, and I want to fill you in on it. What happens is they then say to Jesus, okay, Jesus, what sign are you going to do so that we can believe? They've seen all these signs, but they want more. They're more concerned about getting and continuing. And they say, well, Moses fed the people of Israel in the desert manna for 40 years. In other words, they wanted to keep coming. They're more concerned about their desires and their wants, their entitlement, what they feel they have coming. They want a political, powerful, material solution to all their problems. They're missing the whole point. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me, and still you do not believe. Unfortunately, they missed the point. The whole point is that Jesus is the bread of life. He's the one that's the source. He's the one that nourishes us and feeds our soul and makes life taste good and helps us to understand why we're here and points us in the right direction and gives us purpose and meaning. He's the one that we need to focus on. He is the source of all that nourishes us. 
All right. Um, they were fixated on signs and not the one who was the point of eternal life. They wanted Jesus to give them things, and they wanted Jesus to impress them. They were more concerned with what um, was important to them. Crowds are fickle. I want to close with a story that um, Ken Davis, a, he's, a, he's a wonderful Christian comedian, um, tells about himself. And Ken is a very successful, very capable person, but as a young person, he wasn't so much so. He grew up in a community where athletics was really important, and he says that he had the, coordin the hand-eye coordination of a carp. <laughs> in other words, it wasn't going to happen. He was never going to be an athlete. And so because of the awkward manner in which he grew up, um, he was teased mercilessly all during his school years. Um, that is until you go someplace else where you're not recognized. And so one summer he went to Christian camp for the summer. And now it was a new group of people and they didn't know that he was awkward and they didn't know how um, silly he was and so they weren't picking on him. And what do people who've been picked on typically do? pick on people. And so he found people in that camp that he gave a hard time, and particularly one young man who had physical and mental disabilities, and he began to pick on this young man named Bernie, and he gave him a rough time about the way he walked and the way he talked and the way he thought. Um, and, and Ken has a great gift. He's a comedian. He has a great sense of humor. And so he was merciless with this young boy all week long in camp until something very unique happened on the very last day of that camp. He and his friends were all standing around. They were waiting for the bus to come to take them back from camp. They had their sleeping bags, their, their money in their envelopes from the canteen that was left over. They were all sitting around there talking, shooting the breeze. When he heard in the distance Bernie screaming at the top of his lungs, Good news! Good news! And he sees Bernie coming and he's running towards them and he starts thinking feverishly you know, what can I say what funny thing can I say to make everybody all my buddies that are standing here think that I'm the funniest guy in camp at the very end of camp to, to give Bernie a hard time and put him down but Bernie's too fast and he busts into the circle um, just as Ken's trying to figure out what to say and he goes good news good news Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And before Ken could even think, Bernie burst through their circle again and ran running through the camp yelling, Good news! Good news! And Ken says, On that day, Bernie that little disabled young man knew and understood more profound, deep things than some of the most brilliant, intelligent people on this planet will ever understand. And that's that the God that created all things, that created them, made them, that also came as their Messiah, their Savior, the one to rescue them from their sin and give them purpose, He loves them. He loves you. And because of that, you're set free. You're given purpose and meaning. You're made in his image even. He fills you with his spirit and he gives you the strength and the ability to overcome the sin and the struggles that you face on a daily basis. Why? Because Jesus loves you. Why do we love Jesus? Because he's loved us like nobody else ever will. And we don't have to worry about impressing anybody at work or our neighbor. Um, we don't have to worry about the fact that we may be struggling in school or what other people think about us in school. When we know that God, that Jesus, has loved us enough to give his life for us, there is nothing more important than that. It gives all life meaning. It gives all life taste and smell and beauty. And we can go out and proclaim, Jesus loves me. And he loves you that same way. 
That's what God would have us to do and to be. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the fact that you do love us, that you loved us enough to give your very life for us. And you want us to know that. You want us to be confident of it. You don't want our faith to falter. You want us to remember, Lord, that you are our creator, but you're also our Messiah, our Savior, who's come for us. You're a God who didn't take shortcuts, but you gave everything that was necessary for our saving. And you are the bread of life. You're the most delicious part of life. You give flavor and meaning and purpose. Help us to believe it, to trust you, and to remember that you love us and you set us free. Father, if there's anybody here who's never understood that fully, who's never put their, the full weight of their life down on that truth and that reality, that, that we love Jesus because he's loved us first, then I ask that you'd help them, Lord, to do it today, to say in their hearts and minds in prayer to you, to call out and say, say, Lord, I need your good news. I need you. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for coming for me and dying for my sin. I confess it to you. I turn away from it and I turn to you. In the name of Jesus, your son, I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me, that you would fill me and give me a new heart, and that you would enable me, Lord, to live like you have, to love like you have, and to serve by your strength. Father, thank you for being here. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us good reasons, many, for us to love you. I pray that you'd help us to be a people that do that with deep passion and commitment. It's in Jesus' precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Um, we are not going to, to give um, an offering that we would take up at any time right now. Um, but we want to worship the Lord in song, and so we're going to sing a hymn. We're going to sing, Oh, Happy Day That Fixed My Choice. Let's stand and worship God in song together.
We are very thankful for our choir who sacrifices and serves us this way and is growing, and we're thankful for that as well as we continue to lift high the name of Christ this morning. Jesus Christ, the treasure of the If you would please stand. And thank you, choir. That was beautiful. We want to remember uh, the family of Blanche Johnston, and we will let you know when we know more about how we can celebrate um, her life and her love for the Lord. Receive this blessing. Jesus did come as both our Creator and the Messiah the one who rescued us and saved us. But, but why did he lead the apostles out on that seashore that day? The reason he did it was because he was brokenhearted. He'd heard that day that John the Baptist had been beheaded, and he went there to be alone and to receive from the Lord. But he did things the Father's way. On that day, he did that great miracle that showed who he was and revealed his nature and revealed that he was the bread of life, that he came to give his life for you and me, to show us his great love and ultimately to fill you and me with that love. Be filled with his spirit, be filled with his body and blood, and, and go in great power and confidence to love like him. Amen.